This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Eve's Diary by Mark Twain, translated from the original, Part 1. Saturday. I am almost a whole day old now. I arrived yesterday, that is, as it seems to me. And it must be so, for if there was a day before yesterday, I was not there when it happened. Or I should remember it. It could be, of course, that it did happen, and that I was not noticing. Very well. I will be very watchful now, and if any day before yesterday's happen, I will make a note of it. It will be best to start right, and not let the record get confused for some instinct tells me that these details are going to be important to the historian some day. For I feel like an experiment. I feel exactly like an experiment. It would be impossible for a person to feel more like an experiment than I do. And so I am coming to feel convinced that that is what I am, an experiment, just an experiment and nothing more. Then if I am an experiment, am I the whole of it? No, I think not. I think the rest of it is part of it. I am the main part of it, but I think the rest of it has its share in the matter. Is my position assured, or do I have to watch it and take care of it? The latter, perhaps. Some instinct tells me that the eternal vigilance is the price of supremacy. That is a good phrase, I think, for one so young. Everything looks better today than it did yesterday. In the rush of finishing up yesterday, the mountains were left in a ragged condition and some of the plains were so cluttered with rubbish and remnants that the aspects were quite distressing. Noble and beautiful works of art should not be subjected to haste. And this majestic new world is indeed a most noble and beautiful work, and certainly marvellously near to being perfect, notwithstanding the shortness of the time. There are too many stars in some places, and not enough in others, but that can be remedied presently, no doubt. The moon got loose last night, and slid down, and fell out of the scheme. A very great loss. It breaks my heart to think of it. There isn't another thing, among the ornaments and decoration, that is comparable to it, for beauty and finish. It should have been fastened better, if we can only get it back again. But of course there is no telling where it went to, and besides, whoever gets it will hide it. I know it, because I would do it myself. I believe I can be honest in all other matters but I already begin to realize that the core and center of my nature is love of the beautiful, a passion for the beautiful, and that it would not be safe to trust me with a moon that belonged to another person, and that person didn't know I had it. I could give up a moon that I found in the daytime, because I should be afraid someone was looking. But if I found it in the dark, I am sure I should find some kind of an excuse for not saying anything about it. For I do love moons. They are so pretty and so romantic. I wish I had five or six. I would never go to bed. I should never get tired of lying on the moss bank and looking up at them. Stars are good, too. I wish I could get some to put in my hair. But I suppose I never can. You would be surprised to find out how far off they are, for they do not look it. When they first showed last night, I tried to knock some down with a pole, but it didn't reach, which astonished me. Then I tried clods till I was all tired out, but I never got one. It was because I am left-handed and cannot throw good. Even when I aimed at the one I wasn't after, I couldn't hit the other one, though I did make some close shots, for I saw the black dot of the clod sail right into the midst of the golden clusters forty or fifty times, just barely missing them. And if I could have held out a little longer, maybe I could have got one. So I cried a little which was natural, I suppose, for one of my age, and after I was rested I got a basket and started for a place on the extreme rim of the circle, where the stars were close to the ground, and I could get them with my hands, which would be better anyway, because I could gather them tenderly then and not break them. But it was further than I thought, and at last I had to give it up. I was so tired I couldn't drag my feet another step, and besides they were so sore and hurt me very much. I couldn't get back home. It was too far and turning cold. But I found some tigers and nestled in among them, and was most adorably comfortable. And their breath was sweet and pleasant, because they live on strawberries. I had never seen a tiger before, but I knew them in a minute by the stripes. If I could have one of those skins, it would make a lovely gown. Today I am getting better ideas about distances. 
I was so eager to get hold of every pretty thing that I giddily grabbed for it, sometimes when it was too far off, and sometimes when it was but six inches away but seemed a foot. Alas, with thorns in between. I learned a lesson. Also, I made an axiom, all out of my own head, my very first one. The scratched experiment shuns the thorn. I think it's a very good one, for one so young. I followed the other experiment around yesterday afternoon, at a distance, to see what it might be for, if I could. But I was not able to make out. I think it is a man. I had never seen a man, but it looked like one, and I feel sure that that is what it is. I realize that I feel more curiosity about it than about any of the other reptiles, if it is a reptile, and I suppose it is, for it has frowsy hair and blue eyes, and looks like a reptile. It has no hips. It tapers like a carrot when it stands. It spreads itself apart like a derrick, so I think it is a reptile, though it may be architecture. I was afraid of it at first, and started to run every time it turned around, for I thought it was going to chase me. But by and by I found it was only trying to get away. So after that I was not timid any more, but tracked it along several hours, about twenty yards behind, which made it very nervous and unhappy. At last it was a good deal worried, and climbed a tree. I waited a good while, then gave it up, and went home. Today the same thing over. I've got it up the tree again. Sunday. It is up there yet, resting apparently, but that is a subterfuge. Sunday isn't the day of rest. Saturday is appointed for that. It looks to me like a creature that is more interested in resting than in anything else. It would tire me to rest so much. It tires me just to sit around and watch the tree. I do wonder what it is for. I never see it do anything. They returned the moon last night, and I was so happy. I think it was very honest of them. It slid down and fell off again, but I was not distressed. There is no need to worry when one has that kind of neighbors. They will fetch it back. I wish I could do something to show my appreciation. I would like to send them some stars, for we have more than we can use. I mean I, not we, for I can see that the reptile cares nothing for such things. It has low tastes and is not kind. When I went there yesterday evening in the gloaming, it had crept down and was trying to catch the little speckled fishes that play in the pool, and I had to clod it to make it go up the tree again and let them alone. I wonder if that is what it is for. Hasn't it any heart? Hasn't it any compassion for those little creatures? Can it be that it was designed and manufactured for such ungentle work? It has the look of it. One of the clods took it back of the ear, and it used language. It gave me a thrill for it was the first time I had ever heard speech except my own. I did not understand the words, but they seemed expressive. When I found that it could talk, I felt a new interest in it, for I love to talk. I talk all day, and in my sleep too, and I am very interesting. But if I had another to talk to, I could be twice as interesting, and would never stop if desired. If this reptile is a man, it isn't an it, is it? That wouldn't be grammatical, would it? I think it would be he. I think so. In that case, one would parse it thus. Nominative, he. Dative, him. Possessive, hisn. Well, I will consider it a man and call it he until it turns out to be something else. This will be handier than having so many uncertainties. Next week, Sunday. All the week I tagged around after him and tried to get acquainted. I had to do the talking, because he was shy, but I didn't mind it. He seemed pleased to have me around, and I used the sociable we a good deal, because it seemed to flatter him to be included. Wednesday. We are getting along very well indeed now, and getting better and better acquainted. He does not try to avoid me any more, which is a good sign, and shows that he likes to have me with him. That pleases me and I study to be useful to him in every way I can, so as to increase his regard. During the last day or two, I have taken all the work of naming things off his hands, and this has been a great relief to him, for he has no gift in that line, and is evidently very grateful. He can't think of a rational name to save him, but I do not let him see that I am aware of his defect. Whenever a new creature comes along, I name it before he has time to expose himself by an awkward silence. 
In this way I have saved him many embarrassments. I have no defect like this. The minute I set eyes on an animal, I know what it is. I don't have to reflect a moment. The right name comes out instantly, just as if it were an inspiration, as no doubt it is, for I am sure it wasn't in me half a minute before. I seem to know, just by the shape of the creature and the way it acts, what animal it is. When the dodo came along, he thought it was a wild cat. I saw it in his eye, but I saved him, and I was careful not to do it in a way that could hurt his pride. I just spoke up, in a quiet, natural way, of pleasing surprise, and not as if I was dreaming of conveying information, and said, "'Well, if I do declare, if there isn't the dodo!' I explained, without seeming to be explaining, how I knew it for a dodo, and although I thought maybe he was a little piqued that I knew the creature when he didn't, it was quite evident that he admired me. That was very agreeable, and I thought of it more than once with gratification before I slept." How little a thing can make us happy when we feel that we have earned it. Thursday. My first sorrow. Yesterday he avoided me, and seemed to wish I would not talk to him. I could not believe it, and thought there was some mistake, for I loved to be with him, and loved to hear him talk. So how could it be that he could feel unkind toward me when I had not done anything? But at last it seemed true. So I went away, and sat lonely in the place where I first saw him the morning that we were made and I did not know what he was, and was indifferent about him. But now it was a mournful place, and every little thing spoke of him, and my heart was very sore. I did not know why, very clearly, for it was a new feeling. I had not experienced it before, and it was all a mystery, and I could not make it out. But when night came I could not bear the lonesomeness, and went to the new shelter which he has built to ask him what I had done that was wrong, and how could I mend it and get back his kindness again. But he put me out in the rain, and it was my first sorrow. End of Part 1